would you remain standing for the reading of God's word from Matthew chapter 16, verses 1 through 12. If you have your Bible with you or a device, I encourage you to keep it open with us this morning, for it is our only foundation. And I want you to be Bereans, don't just take my word for it. So let's read the word together. And the Pharisees and Sadducees came, and to test him, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. He answered them, When it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be stormy today, for the sky is red and threatening. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. So he left them and departed. And when the disciples reached the other side, they had forgotten to bring any bread. And Jesus said to them, Watch and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And they began discussing it among themselves, saying, We brought no bread. But Jesus, aware of this, said, O you of little faith, why are you discussing among yourselves the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive? Do you not remember the five loaves for the five thousand and how many baskets you gathered? Or the seven loaves for the four thousand and how many baskets you gather? How is it that you fail to understand that I did not speak about bread? Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. It's God's word for God's people. You may be seated. And let's pray again and ask for his help in hearing from his word this morning. So, Father, we need you to help us see Jesus. We cannot interpret your word without your help. We cannot see the glory of Christ without your grace giving us eyes to see. We will not remember without your grace causing to just drive this truth deep down within us. And we will forget without your grace as soon as we walk out of this room. And so we need you. We praise you that you have promised you will not leave us off, but that in those whom you have began a good work, you will bring it to completion on the day of Christ Jesus. So teach us, speak to us, feed us, and shape us more and more into the image of your Son this morning, we pray. Amen. You don't go too long in Michigan without someone at some point commenting on the weather. Sunny yesterday, blizzard today, hashtag pure Michigan, right? And two Fridays ago, I left the office to head to Grace's basketball game with the snow coming down so fast that visibility was limited. And while the van warmed up, I checked my weather app because I didn't remember seeing anything about snow earlier. And sure enough, what did the app tell me? It was just cloudy, and there was a 0% chance of precipitation, not only for that hour, but for the rest of that night, and all through Saturday. But what happened when I looked up? <laughs> the uh, meteorologists and their algorithms, no matter what they said, were wrong. It was snowing, and if you recall, uh, it snowed all through Saturday, and it has seemingly not stopped since that first storm came through. And people have been trying to predict the weather for thousands of years, as even Jesus knew how people in his day tried to predict the weather. A red sky in the evening means good weather, a red morning sky means bad weather. But Jesus here in chapter 16 is not just shooting the breeze with his friends about the weather. Jesus takes what the people of his day normally did, and he turns it into a rebuke. In fact, in our uh, time this morning, in verses 1 through 12, we will look through two rebukes and one warning to shape our time. So first, let's look at this initial rebuke of Jesus. In verses 2 and 3, Jesus talks about how people try to figure out the weather by the signs they can read in the sky. Because in verse 1, the Pharisees and Sadducees came to him asking for a sign from heaven in order to test him. Now this word test is the same word that we saw earlier in Matthew in chapter 4 when Satan 
comes to test Jesus in the wilderness after 40 days and 40 nights of fasting before his earthly ministry began. And so the Pharisees and Sadducees haven't come to Jesus because they've heard these amazing reports of his mighty works, and they're really wondering, is this the one? Is this God's promised Messiah? Now they've come to oppose him. They're attempting to discredit him publicly. And this testing is really a no-win situation for Jesus. If you remember this phrase, we've already seen him do this in chapter 12, haven't we? It's a no-win situation. Because even if he does give them a miraculous sign, what will they say to him? Just like they did in chapter 12. Uh, he does that by the power of Satan. And so if we're supposed to see, I think, and we are, this tie between the word test here and the word test in chapter 4, then we still see here at work Satan behind the scenes, still opposing Jesus, still trying to get Jesus to operate outside God the Father's authority and mission. He's still tempting Jesus to work for his own glory. And that testing comes in such a sneaky way, right? You're from heaven. All right, Jesus, we're the religious authorities now. If you're really from heaven, show us an irrefutable sign from heaven, one from God, and we'll believe you. And yet Jesus doesn't take the bait and instead calmly answers by talking about the weather. But it's not unconnected to their request, is it? It's a brilliant play on words. Y you look up the sky and you can tell me what, my, what the day's weather is going to be like. Uh, but you have no idea how to interpret the signs of the times. In other words, you ask for a sign, a sign from heaven to prove that I am who I say I am, that God has truly sent me from heaven, yet a super abundance of signs have been all around you. And very recently, you don't know the signs of the times. What are those signs of the times? Well, just look back a page, starting with chapter 14. There, among the people of Israel, Jesus fed 5,000 men plus women and children from how many loaves of bread? Just five. And they had 12 baskets full of leftovers. A clear sign from heaven that Jesus is the bread of life. The one God sent to be the abundant provision for his people. Now then when he gets to the other side of the sea, which he did by walking on it, the Gentile crowds recognize who Jesus is. And they bring all their sick to him. And he heals them all. Uh, but the Pharisees and scribes are still at it. And Jesus calls out their hypocrisy at the beginning of chapter 15. But then what do we see? A Canaanite woman comes with great faith to Jesus. And after that, Jesus heals many Gentiles of all sorts of illnesses and diseases. And he did it with such authority. And he did it completely. He healed them all fully. He does it in such complete wholeness that the crowd is filled with awe and wonder. And it says the Gentiles are led to glorify the God of Israel. Gentile, the nations, the glory of God is covering the earth as the waters cover the sea. The nations are beholding and proclaiming the glory of God. Surely that's a sign from heaven that God is at work. He's fulfilling his Old Testament prophetic promises. And then finally, Jesus feeds a hungry crowd of 4,000 Gentile men plus women and children from seven loaves and a few fish, and there's seven baskets full of leftovers, and seven just as a biblical symbol for perfection. So you got the 12 baskets representing the 12 tribes of Israel, and seven baskets full representing God's complete whole provision for the nations, for salvation. And so he's done these signs, first among Israel and now for the nations. Yet as Jesus arrives back, he got in the boat himself, it says. He arrives back on Jewish soil, and he's met there with the religious leaders not welcoming him and interpreting these signs for what they should be interpreted. Instead, they ratchet up the opposition, and they demand a sign from heaven. And he says, you know how to figure out the weather by looking at the sky. But you, the, the religious leaders, are blind to the clear signs from heaven all around you. It's a willful blindness. It stems from hard hearts, a love of self, a love of the praise of men. And so Jesus declares them 
evil and adulterous. It's prophetic language, Old Testament prophetic language for rebellion against God. That their hearts have been divided, that they're loving things other than God. And the Pharisees and Sadducees oppose Jesus instead of humbly responding to the clear acts of God the Father. Bringing his kingdom in the person and work of Jesus through the power of God the Spirit on earth as it is in heaven. Heaven's broken in. The kingdom of God has come upon them and they're blind to it. And so Jesus will not perform on command. It's not his mission. And that, they probably already knew that from their time with Jesus in chapter 12. They, they, they already knew with, that he would not just perform this miracle for them on demand. And that's probably what they wanted. So they could turn around to the crowds and say, see, he's not who he says he is. But while Jesus doesn't perform on command here, he does say a sign is coming. One that will surely be a sign from heaven. Jesus says that the sign of Jonah will be given to them. So just as Jonah spent three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, that's what we read in, again in Matthew chapter 12, so Jesus will spend three days and nights in the heart of the earth. And just as Jonah was delivered out from the belly of the great fish, so Jesus will come out of the grave when God raises him up. So the point is, Jesus won't do a sign for them. Jesus is the sign. He himself will be the irrefutable sign that the kingdom of God has come upon them. And so Jesus points them back to what God is doing. It's like, it's not about me, but what is God doing in me by the power of the Spirit? The sign of Jonah will be given to show what God is doing to save his people from their sins. And then in an act of judgment, Jesus leaves and departs from them. So this rebuke is a rebuke that leads to stark judgment. It's meant to make them come face to face with their willful rebellion about what God is doing right then and there for his kingdom. Now what can we learn from this first rebuke? Well, two things. One, Jesus rebukes them for knowing how to see and interpret temporal things, like weather, yet completely miss matters of eternal importance. He rebukes them for knowing how to figure out temporal things, but completely missing out on matters of eternal importance. What do you know how to do? What things do you spend your days thinking about or planning for, but are disconnected from what God is doing for His glory among the nations? I mean, can you tell others your take on current events and cultural trends? Can you talk about sports? Can you, can you talk, I don't know, about anything? And yet you can't talk for very long about why and how God the Father brings his kingdom in the person and work of Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit on earth as it is in heaven. Well, let's not be people who can tell others all about things that have no bearing on eternity. So then, too, are you wearied and troubled in these days? Are you wearied and troubled? Well, remember the sign of Jonah. It's not just a past sign that has no bearing on us anymore. Do you ever get down? Do you ever, do you ever just get tired of things? suffering or life or uh, just the constant press of whatever is going on around you. Are you wearied and troubled? Well, remember the sign of Jonah, that Jesus has come, and he saved his people, and he's not still in the grave. He's the first fruits of a promised resurrection. His resurrection means his kingdom has come, and he is reigning right now over all. He is building his church. We'll see that next week, and he's coming again to make all things forever new. So in the midst of all that is wearying and troubling, the sign of Jonah is still for us today. That Jesus is alive. That's not just an Easter truth. It what, it's, it's what animates our lives every day. He is alive, and he is reigning, and he's coming again. So remember the sign of Jonah in the midst of all that wearies you and troubles. Next, the second rebuke. The second rebuke comes in verses 8 through 11. 
And this rebuke is meant to strengthen and grow faith. So Jesus uses rebukes in two ways we see the Bible using them. One, he, he rebukes in judgment and leaves them in judgment to consider the words. In other times, the rebuke, you come alongside someone and rebuke them. Remember, Jesus just rebuked Peter. When did Jesus rebuke Peter? When he was sinking up to his neck in water? At the same time, he was reaching out his hand to save him. And we'll see why in just a moment. But look at verses 8 through 11 as Jesus again rebukes now the disciples' little faith. Now, at the end of chapter 15, after feeding the crowd, Jesus dismisses the crowd, just as he did at the end of chapter 14, but now he gets in the boat by himself and crosses back over the sea. So when he arrives on the shore, he's alone with the Pharisees and Sadducees as they opposed him. So when the disciples arrive here in verse 5, Matthew tells us right out of the gate that they forgot to bring bread. Which I take to mean... Uh, they didn't bring any of the leftovers that Jesus had just got done filling those baskets full of. They, they had food all over the place, and they got in the boat and forgot to bring any of it with them. That's what I think Matthew's trying to tell us. So as they reunite with Jesus here in verse 6, instead of saying, hey, what's up, fellas? He goes, watch and beware the, of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. That's kind of a weird greeting very cryptic. And remember, they just got here. So maybe they see the Pharisees and Sadducees off in the distance, but we're not told that, nor does Matthew tell us that Jesus gave them a rundown of what just happened. All we're told is they arrive, and Jesus says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And so they begin, probably under their breath, discussing it amongst themselves, this strange greeting. And in a group of 12 men, I'm sure one of them was always hungry. Yet someone, pro so someone had probably already realized on the, on the boat over, man, we left all that food back there, and I'm starving. They left those take-home sacks on the other side. Have you ever done that? You, like, you pay for a nice meal. They ask if you want to box it up. You say yes. You pay, but you get up and go. You're out in your car, and you're like, oh, I left it on the table, and you hustle back in, and the, the person who cleared the table's already thrown it away. That's what happened here. Whichever disciple was in charge of making sure everyone had everything they needed completely failed. Uh, my wife's a gift to our family in this way. We never forget anything, anytime we go anywhere because she's packed it. You can just look at our Facebook for when we go on trips to how crammed full our van is. And it never fails that after I make fun of her about it, that I can barely breathe in the van and I'm feeling a, t a tad claustrophobic, that someone has forgotten something or doesn't have something they were supposed to bring and she pulls it out and just smiles. So if Becky's ever with you on a trip, which I know some of you have already experienced this, and you forgot something, she has an extra. Just ask her for it. The problem is the disciples didn't have a Becky. <laughs> they had 12 JJs who think they got it together, <laughs> who think they know what's going on and have really got life figured out now but are extremely ridiculously slow learners. And so they start looking at each other. Jesus says something about Levin, and they're like, man, he knows. Did Jesus always know? How does he always know? We forgot bread. That's why he's talking about Levin. And Jesus, because he does always know, because he's the Son of God, aware of their discussion, meaning he's not just overhearing it, he knows what they're thinking in his heart, responds in verse 8, O oh, you of little faith, again, Here's that rebuke. You of little faith. It's, it, in, in the uh, language here, it's, he's really calling, it's not just saying something about them. He's calling them little faith ones. Oh, it's like his nickname, right? Instead of saying JJ, he's, he would be calling you, hey, little faith, get over here. And, and that, that's how he's really, so the English kind of mellows it out a little bit. He's not just saying something about their faith. He's saying, he's calling them little faith ones. He's like, hey, you little faith guys, why are you discussing among yourselves the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive? Do you not remember, remember the five loaves for the 5,000 
and how many baskets you gathered? Or the seven loaves for the 4,000 and how many baskets you gathered? How is it that you fail to understand that I did not speak about bread? If you're hungry, ask. I can just give you bread, seemingly out of nowhere. We see the similarity here with the first rebuke, when Jesus says, why are you talking about bread? He rebukes his disciples for their consuming concern for temporal things. Bread? Have you just forgotten the last two weeks of your life with me? Do you not perceive? But notice how Jesus connects their little faith to their concern. So he's their faith to the temporal things. The, the problem isn't a lack of bread. What's their problem? The, it's their failure to trust God's ability to provide whatever they need. Y you will always have legitimate temporal concerns. I'm going to say that again. You will always have legitimate temporal concerns. You will die if you don't eat. You will. If, if you don't have water and food, you will not make it very long. Th that, that's not the point. You will always have temporal concerns that are legitimate. But those concerns must never become your ultimate concern. Temporal concerns must never become your ultimate concern. I recently listened to Kevin DeYoung and Justin Taylor and Colin Hansen's podcast where they interview Tim Keller. And he talks at length for a little bit in the middle there with his battle with cancer and the, the, the treatment that he's undergoing. Now, they say battling cancer in, in that, and that's what people say. And Tim Keller knows what they mean, but he doesn't say he's battling cancer. He says he's battling sin. That the battle when he was younger has not changed now that he's older. The battle for faith in Jesus. To keep looking to Jesus as the author and finisher of his faith. He, 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 cancer isn't his biggest problem, he says. Uh, it is a problem. If it, if it does not uh, get treated and he's not healed from it, this or a complication of it will, will kill him. So cancer is a problem. Not having food is a problem. Whatever you're facing and some of your temporal concerns right now is a problem. But it's not your biggest problem. So Keller tells people he's battling sin, not cancer. Man, his biggest problem is his sin. What do we battle? He points us back to New Testament biblical language. We battle the world, we battle our flesh, and we battle the devil. Th that's what we're battling. Our main problem, our main fight in life is this spiritual fight for faith. That's the battle. And oh, you of little faith. That, not because lacking bread isn't an issue, but because their consuming concern with temporal things reveals this heart that is failing to trust God. And so the rebuke continues. And how does Jesus continue this rebuke? He doesn't say, what are you worried about? You have an in infinite supply of bread right here with you. D he doesn't say that, does he? He doesn't say, what are you worried about? Why? Because there's always things in this life to worry about. But what does Jesus say in verses 9 and 10? Don't you remember the five loaves for the 5,000 and all the leftovers? And the seven loaves for the 4,000 and all the leftovers? I'm not talking about bread. So he rebukes their forgetfulness. Do you not remember? And that he, He's rebuking their worry that has driven them deeper into temporal concerns, temporal things, rather than those things driving them deeper into God. And he calls them to remember the signs of the times. The same things he's rebuking the Pharisees and the Sadducees for not seeing, not perceiving. He says, remember. And that word remember there is a, is a strong verb. It's the strongest word about remembering you can, you can uh, have. And it, it means to recall to mind in a way that 
actually changes you. That brings lasting change. Uh, you know, it's like when you were a kid and you stuck your finger in the socket after your parents told you not to a bunch of times, and then it shocked the snot out of you, right? Then all of a sudden you remember the warning in a way that, like, yeah, I'm never going to do that again. That's what he's trying to say here, okay? Like, it's like those near-death experiences, or it's those moments in life that are just crystal clear when you look back in the past that th that moment changed me. That's the type of word remember means in such a way that you're not the same person anymore after that moment. So he doesn't just say, like, hey, hey, remember when, you know, back in the day I just fed all those people, wasn't that cool, and everyone has a, you know, a good old laugh about it, and then on we go. That Jesus is not on his deck reminiscing with his friends about the good old days. He's saying, remember, drive it deep within you. Plant that truth so deep that it brings lasting change. That's the rebuke. Remember who your God is. So what can we learn about this second rebuke? Again, two things. One, being consumed with the temporal and spiritual forgetfulness are still dangers today. It's been the people of God's failure since the time they were wandering around in the wilderness that they forget God. And that is still a danger today. And so much so with our technology at our fingertips all the time, we're even more tempted to be consumed with the temporal. And, and think about it, just our life in the past year. I, I can have conversations for hours that will never end about Government protocols, government overreach, masks, whatever you want to talk about. I can, I can find someone who is a Christian who will talk to me for hours about that. But who don't really want to spend 10 minutes talking about Jesus with me. And as a pastor, I want to be very clear that sometimes I get consumed with the temporal things. And I fail to think about Jesus for more than 10 minutes at a time. Uh, Revelation 1.5, and um, during my sabbatical, I studied Revelation, and someday I'll get brave enough to teach it. But until that moment, here's a little snippet. It starts with this vision of Jesus, and Revelation 1, verse 5 says, Jesus is ruler of the kings of earth. These are people who are going through actual persecution. He is the ruler of the kings of earth, so he reigns. He reigns over Michigan, no matter who the governor is. He reigns over our country, no matter what happens. And so I'm not a fan of masks, and, I'm, and I look forward to the day when I can see you and, and, and fully, right? And, you know, maybe smell coffee breath again once, just once, and then I don't want to smell it again, but I want it maybe one day. And where they're just not a regular thing. But how many hours of our lives have been wasted, consumed with something that you will not be wearing 100 years from now? Because you'll be dead. And in that moment, you'll either be in Jesus' presence or not. That's what matters. And again, please hear me. I'm not saying that these temporal concerns are not legitimate or that you shouldn't do anything. I'm, but stop. That's not the point. It's all the exceptions and all the rationales that, again, lead us to be consumed with the temporal. But we cannot allow temporal things to blind us from the eternal things that ultimately do matter. And you know what's going to happen as soon as you're not wearing masks? There will be something else tempting you to be wrapped up in the temporal. What are you tempted right now, this afternoon, to spend your day being consumed with rather, rather than seeing the glory and beauty of Jesus? And that's where you have to start. That's where the Bible starts. That's where Jesus starts. 
So again, it's not that those things don't matter, but do you see what Jesus does? We usually elevate the temporal and then try to get to the eternal. What does Jesus do? He says, remember the eternal. Remember me and then get to the temporal. We can't allow temporal things to blind us from the eternal matters of great importance. And so one way to fight for faith in this way is to daily set your mind upon God's faithfulness, his constant steadfast love and mercy, that his grace is inexhaustible, and to remind yourself that his sovereignty will never come to an end. And that if he does lead you to go through a fire, like we just said, what's the fire for? To consume the dross and to refine and purify you, to make you more like Jesus. No one likes it. No one says we should like it. But what's Jesus doing in it all? He's refining his people. And we can trust his love because he's both loving and sovereign. So remind yourself of that daily to keep the eternal things of utmost importance. The second thing to see in this, rebu uh, to see in this rebuke is that Jesus never leaves his own people. I don't know if you've caught that, but he left the Pharisees and Sadducees. And so much so, it's emphatic. He leaves and departs from them. It's just a weird way of saying, you know, he, he, he left them, period, full stop, walks away. It's the, it's the Greek way of being super emphatic. But he never leaves his own people. The same guys, both groups are missing the signs of the times. One, Jesus just says, your sign's coming. And it's the sign of Jonah, that irrefutable sign. And if you continue to oppose me, you will be left in your sin. But what does he do for his own people? He explains it. He rebukes them, but in a way to grow and strengthen their faith. He, he, he calls them, in spite of their failing, to trust God's ability to provide more than they could ever amass or ask or imagine. He calls them to a deeper trust in God. You see that? It's, this is not a call to try harder or pull yourself up by your faith bootstraps or, you know, I got to start doing it and I got to start doing it and I start doing it. It's a call to daily remember all that God has already done for us and all his promises that are sure. That's the call. And so we must see that Jesus never leaves his own people, but this rebuke is not meant to leave us where we are, but to grow and strengthen our faith in him. And that then leads to this final warning. Now, I'm a little out of order here because the warning is actually before the second rebuke and it's here at the end. But just in an easy way to put it together, we have these two rebukes and then this warning. And the warning comes in verse 6 and then again in verse 11. Watch and beware the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, uh, he puts them together there. They're working uh, in conjunction here. They're one group, but they're actually two separate groups, and they did not like each other. They were opponents. The Pharisees were the conservatives. The Sadducees were the liberals. They did not agree on very much. They didn't really like each other. Uh, there was no meaningful bipartisanship in Israelite religious leadership those days. It was probably like watching what's going on now. Even if the other side's right, one side can't ever say that's true. They're, they don't like each other. They're, so imagine that this culture, this cultural climate that we're in, all of a sudden, everyone in America is like standing united. Now, what would have, what, what would make bitter opponents be joyfully united? They both hate Jesus. They're, op, they're opposing Jesus. So it's not so much their specific views. The teaching of the so it's like the teaching, but he says what they're teaching is a, a united subject. The Pharisees and Sadducees. It's one group. But since the one group has vastly different teachings, Jesus can't really be talking about their specific teachings. Okay? Do you get that? Do you understand? They taught separate things. So he's not saying that because here they are standing united. So what's he getting at? He's not so much talking about their specific views of the Old Testament law or of the government, the Roman occupation, or on their teaching about how one becomes right with God. What Jesus is really talking about is the those heart and teaching uh, uh, themes that lead to their unity in opposing God's salvation in Jesus Christ. That the Pharisees and Sadducees oppose that Jesus was God. 
Remember what we're doing here in this section of Matthew. Matthew's trying to answer the question, who is Jesus? Well, Jesus has told us, and God has shown us with all these clear signs, and the Pharisees and Sadducees oppose that. They're saying, no, Jesus isn't God. He's not the way, the truth, and the life. He's not the way that you get to the Father. In fact, he's a blasphemer, and in fact, Satan's use, er, he's working from Satan's power. He's going to lead you astray. So Jesus warns his disciples to beware of this false teaching and this heart attitude that leads this group of religious leaders to reject God's saving purposes in Christ. And this is in stark contrast. Remember the context of Matthew here. What happened in chapter 14 after Jesus walked on water? Gentiles came running to him. Then in chapter 15, we have hypocrisy from the Pharisees and the scribes, yet at the same time, a Canaanite woman who in those days would have been one of the lowest in the low of society came begging for crumbs from Jesus' table. And he says, that's great faith. Faith that I'm not seeing even in Israel. And then in chapter 16, religious leaders again, and many of its people oppose and reject Jesus. So the warning isn't just about false teaching, but how this teaching permeates and impacts your life. And that's why Jesus uses the image of leaven. Leaven is this agent that when you, it's different than yeast, but uh, it, it's, a, it's a thing you add to the ingredients when you make bread, and it causes it to foam, and it traps air bubbles in the loaf when you bake it, so it rises. It's what gives bread its texture makes it, I think, enjoyable to eat. And so leaven, then, is a metaphor. It's a picture of what fills you up. It's what gives your life structure, meaning, worth, identity. Where, wh what are you living on? It's what brings you life and joy. When Jesus warns of the false teachers here, he says, just like very little leaven, comparatively to all the ingredients that makes a loaf of bread, just like very little leaven changes the reality of an entire loaf of bread, what you base your life on, what you fill yourself up with, is a matter of eternal importance. It will change everything. It can change everything. Watch and beware of what you fill yourself up with. So that's the warning. How can we heed it? Again, two things. Two things. Well, one of the problems with the Pharisees and the Sadducees was their heart attitude. That they thought they could get to God themselves. That they could earn it, that they could work for it. They didn't need help. And if they did need help, it certainly wasn't Jesus. So to, for us to heed this warning, we must cultivate a spirit of repentant helplessness. Repentant helplessness by a daily dependence upon Jesus. Cultivate a spirit of helplessness by daily dependence upon Jesus. That's what the Pharisees and Sadducees opposed in order to access God's presence. They thought they, they didn't need Jesus. They had their religious system worked out of how they could get back to God, how they could enjoy his blessing. And then Jesus comes on the scene with all these clear signs, and they oppose him anyways. So I love how Tim Keller puts it in his book, Jesus the King or King's Cross, it used to be called. He says this, he says, Through Jesus, we don't need perfect righteousness, just repentant helplessness to access the presence of God. If you begin anywhere else, you're filling your life up with something that will destroy you. It will ruin the loaf. It will take your joy. And do the things you fill your days with, do what you spend your time on, the things you consume, whether media, relationships, your life, do the things you fill your day with drive you to see and enjoy the glory and beauty of Jesus? And in a moment, as we come to the table, which is about Jesus, and drink a cup representing his blood and a piece of bread representing his broken body, that that is our life and our only hope. We're about to sing, All I Have is Christ. And I wonder if you will take a moment to look back on this past week or this past month 
And I wonder if how you spent your hours and days would be evidence that Christ alone is your hope. That it's not just something we sing at five points, but it's what we ask God to graciously enable us to live out. That all we have is Christ. He is the one that I want and desire. And even when I fail, I know his spirit will enable me to fill my life with him so that Christ will be what fills me up, what gives my life texture and, and joy. So seek Christ, brothers and sisters. Seek Christ. He's the treasure of great price. Don't mess around with lesser temporal joys. Seek what ultimately matters. And finally, secondly, pursuing your life and joy in Christ alone doesn't mean cutting yourself off from everything in this world. Remember, it, it does mean starting with the best of things, with the things that ultimately matter, and then watching what you allow into your heart and mind. Beware of what you allow, even a little bit, that drives you far from Christ, or does not represent Christ, or does not drive you to Christ, even a little bit can leaven the whole loaf. How much social media or, or news or, or friends or, or worries or even the inane things like sports or hobbies, I mean anything, how much of it are you consuming each day? But remember, what fills your hours is what's actually going to fill your life. What you spend your afternoon doing is what you spend your life on. What are you filling your hours with? And is it the bread of life from heaven? So two rebukes and a warning. But the call to every one of us is the same. Come to Christ. All you who are weary and heavy laden, and he will give you rest and life and joy. Let's pray. Father, we come and know that far too often we are consumed with the mundane, spend little time on the eternal. That far too often we run to broken cisterns filled with dirty water rather than drinking full of the fountain of life. So we ask for your spirit to be at work within us. That you would give us eyes to not just see and behold but enjoy the glory and beauty of Jesus, our Savior. That you would help us feed on his life and his death and his resurrection, that who he is and what he's done and what he's promised to do would animate our lives. It would, would be what would fill us up. It would make us who we are. It would fill our life with hope. So that as we live out feasting on Christ, more and more so full of him that we not only just hate sin, but we have no room for it in our lives because we're so full of Christ. And that way of living then would cause the neighbors and the nations around us to look at us as a people filled with hope, even in wearying and troubling times, and be asked, how, why? And that your spirit would Help us answer about the hope that is within us. So do what you've promised to do. We praise you that you never leave off your own people. We confess our unbelief. Help us. We believe. Drive out unbelief. Drive us more and more into deeper communion and life united to your Son with you, we pray. Amen. And as we